As I get going uh, in round two, uh, I just want to say, I just want to demonstrate something, uh, not a deliverance, I just want to demonstrate something uh, that just to make this normal. You know what I love what's happening right now? We're in a room talking about this and Alpha's happening. And while I'm literally talking to you, my 12-year-old daughter is texting me her Christmas list. Um, No, I'm not joking. She's literally Instagramming me what she wants for Christmas. Um, Why am I saying that? Because this is not a special ministry. This just is one of them. So you got to understand, like as we're talking this through, people want to make this this thing. It's just a thing. Uh, You know, the best joy I have in my church when I'm at one of our sites is that a deliverance is happening, there's a strategic planning meeting happening, some people are praying, there's freedom sessions going, Alpha's running, and there's kids programming all in one building. It's just, you gotta, we gotta make the weird normal uh, and just make it, it is. Don't elevate it, it just is. So I love that Alpha's happening and people are hearing about the good news of Jesus while we're talking about this. This is just how church should work. Uh, And hopefully someone's building a strategic plan somewhere. That's good too. Okay. Um... So interesting story, after 13 years of doing this in a multicultural environment, I didn't know if what I was doing was right. And, and the problem was when you're in the trench, you just grab for anything and hope you survive. So I had this really unbelievable opportunity uh, to actually do a doctorate at Fuller in intercultural studies in missions. And I was able to do, my whole doctorate was, am I a heretic, basically, Have I made a mistake for 13 years? And so I theologically was going to do a diagnostic history and theology. And then I looked through every single model I could find within Christian history that had done this in multiple cultural contexts. Here's what I want to bring up. I'm bringing this up not to tell you to do a doctorate. That's irrelevant. That burns on judgment day. Uh, What... um, no, it does. Um, what, what, what actually uh, matters is I was struck by something and I didn't catch it till I was done my graduate studies. So um, when I do this uh, on, a cl- on an ac- academic level, I talk about there's probably four or five uh, models of how this works in a church. One is called the gospel model. That's the John MacArthur get saved and nothing happens to you afterwards model. Um, and then there's the, you know, the Catholic rite of exorcism. Uh, then there's what, that's what we call the liturgical power model. Uh, and then we've got the, uh, the Pentecostal, like kick and evict, shoot him up, Derek Prince, like let's manifest and let go and get out uh, model. Um, no, for real. Some of you know. Um, uh, and then there's like the inner healing Chuck Kraft you know, model that's out there. Then there's the Neil Anderson, uh, you know, we take our stand and we, everyone who's not Pentecostal likes him because he's safe and biblical and all the questions are there for you and it's all great. So um, what's interesting is they all disagree with each other vehemently, but there's one thing they agree on that they never caught, that none of them talk about spiritual gifts. Not one of them. So I want to walk this through with you tonight. And I want to take a detour into a gift conversation and then come back and talk about how some of these gifts work within the context of this type of ministry. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Okay. So there are, a spiritual conflict is basically who has more power. If you really want to get down to it, that's what it is. Who has more bang for their buck in the room? Genuinely. Who's stronger? And um, there is four places where authority is given according to scripture. And they all matter. The first one is common authority. And every Christian on earth has it. doesn't matter their education level, their background, their skin color, their ethnicity. It's irrelevant. Every Christian has it. And um, just the first verse is up there. James 4, 7. Uh, Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That is not to super apostles or people with the gifts of miracles. That's to who? All of us. Uh, Ephesians 2, you're seated in the heavenly realms. We talked about that. Ephesians 6.13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if the day of evil comes, when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, uh, every, done everything to stand, stand. Okay, so let me just work this out. Every Christian has the authority to tell the demonic to leave. But you'll notice that all of these passages are defensive. They're not offensive, they're defensive. When the day of evil comes, when you're tempted by the devil, you have the right to tell the thing to go. And it might be a fight. And by the way, some of you, a few of you listening tonight, I just need to give this to you. I would actually say this might be a word from the Lord for someone in this room or online tonight. You wonder what you're doing wrong because it's taking too long. No, no, no. It's not you say Jesus' name once and it's magic and they leave. This is a real fight. 
So just like when you see in Ephesians, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That word wrestle was taken from the Olympics when two people, two usually naked men, would literally wrestle the other person on the ground, flesh on flesh. That's how close spiritual conflict is. And wrestling takes time. Jesus didn't come with Adam and Eve. So sometimes the fight is minutes, sometimes the fight is days, sometimes the fight is months, but the fight is always won in the end. But don't get discouraged in the middle of the wrestling. You're not doing anything wrong. Keep standing. Okay, so common authority, we've all got. Then there's this thing called office authority, pastors, elders, deacons. The demonic respect and understand that there's God-given designated authority to those who are actually in authority in a community. It's not authority to dominate people, but it is a spiritual authority. I remember that we were dealing with a case years ago in the early days, and actually a friend of mine, and I won't go into it, was severely demonized. We were praying for him, and it was one of the very few deliverance cases where it looked like I was in the Lord of the Rings. Usually it's never like that, but it was very much like that grotesque. And uh, I was praying, and the senior pastor who was telling you who I respect and love, but he was a willow topical preacher, business guy who got saved. Uh, He didn't know what to do with this. And he was literally, like I was in the front confronting this thing as the youth pastor. And it was the only time I brought him as a senior pastor. He was in the corner and the devil growled at me and said, I'm not talking to you. You're not in charge. He is. And looked right at the senior pastor. He prayed a prayer I'd never heard before. I was like, wow, where have you been? Fire from heaven. And I was like, what happened? That's the only time he ever prayed that way that I know. Um, uh, But um, what was amazing is the demonic knew who had more authority in the room. If you're an elder here tonight, you have more authority than you think. Even if you're an elder for a season, you have authority, and it matters. It's not about personality, but it matters. So you've got common authority, you've got office authority. I'm going to say something next. I don't mean this in a disparaging way or a political way, no matter where you stand theologically. Uh, Headship in a marriage is real. And however you work it out, I know I'm in a very progressive city, so I'm being very careful. Uh, all I want to say to this is, you know, one of the best illustrations I've used about headship is a husband should hold the umbrella above his wife spiritually so she has two hands to do more for the kingdom. So it's not about domination. It's not about domineering uh, at all. But I'm just saying that if in a marriage context, uh, there is an authority that is pre-fall uh, in, in creation, that the de- you might not like it, but the demonic acknowledge it. Why am I saying this to you tonight? Because if you're the husband of, uh, if you're a husband here tonight, uh, listen, stand up and guard your family. And I mean that spiritually. Uh, what t- deeply concerns me globally is that I'm continually in environments where I have all these incredible women of God, many of them who are pastors themselves, saying, I end up doing all this and my husband won't even take up the sword. I'm just like, you don't have to be, it's not a big deal, just say in Jesus' name, no, and watch things happen. And I'm just saying again, because it's, it's in the creation order. They, they respect it. You might not, but it's there. Okay, now have you, I've lost you, so I'll come back now. Um, and then the, the last one is gift authority. This is real important, everyone. So where you are anointed by, by the Spirit of God and you're given spiritual gifts, that is actually where you have more authority than your neighbor. So let, let, me, let me demonstrate this. This is so important. If you have the gift of mercy, I don't have the gift of mercy. Are you shocked? Um, no, uh, all right. I'm learning the discipline of mercy. I don't have the gift of mercy. Here, here's the point of this. If you have mercy, the spiritual gift of mercy, there is a power source behind your mercy I don't have because my mercy is me being disciplined. Your mercy is from the spirit of God. So gifts are critical. And what really concerns me from John MacArthur all the way over to the Catholic Church, all the way to Chuck Kraft and Neil Anderson is all of them say, you all have common authority. You should all be doing deliverance ministry or not doing it at all. And you just need, no. We all can stand in seasons. But for a long-term ministry to flourish, you need people who are gifted in that area long-term. So that's the difference between standing or praying or commanding, and then long-term ministry. So are you all with me still, sort of, please? Okay, good, all right. So what I wanna do now is I wanna take a detour with what happened in my church about spiritual gifts because the whole deliverance ministry became actually the incubator for a larger conversation of how gifts work in a multi-site mega church that actually brought a season of revival in our church. And I mean that in the 17th century sense, not the smoke and lights 2021 cents. Okay, so let me begin with this. To understand spiritual gifts and their relationship to your church, to you, 
and also to deliverance, you have to start with Jesus in the Gospels and in the book of John. So in John 5, 19, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, so the son does also. Later, he says a more radical thing in John 14, 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me, so not just the apostles, anyone who has faith in me, so that's most of you here tonight, you online, uh, they will be doing what I have been doing. Do you believe that? Do you see that? I don't see that very much. He will even do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So let me unpack this. Jesus says, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. I only do what the Father tells me to do. So here's my question. How did Jesus hear what he was called to do and how did he see what God the Father was up to and why would Jesus even say such a crazy thing because Jesus is equal with the Father and I thought he was God. And then as I just read, he says to everyday broken people like us, his followers in every century, you will do the same things I've been doing, even greater things than these. So what in the world does this mean? See, here's the shadow in confessional Bible-believing churches that is trying to do right things. We all know that we want to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We all know we're called to imitate Jesus. But Jesus is the second person in the Trinity, and he's God and we're not. So we know we can't actually do the thing we're all supposed to do. So we work really hard, even though we're not, we know we're all not saved by works. But we still have this idea we've got to work real hard because I've got to imitate the second person in the Trinity. And it's really impossible. So I'm going to keep trying, sort of possible in the new heavens, new earth, everything's going to work out. Really? Is that God's plan? So how do I resolve the question of being like Jesus, who's the second person of the Trinity, and then his statement, I get to imitate him? Because here's what's sitting in the room. I can't really imitate Jesus because he's God and I'm not. So to understand the role of spiritual gifts and deliverance and Jesus, you can never start with Jesus. And you're never, never going to start with the Holy Spirit. You need to start with the Father. In Philippians chapter 2, you've got a Bible, flip over there real quick. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul embeds into Philippians uh, this song that was being sung. So this is actually like, this is Hillsong 62 AD or whatever you'd like. This was actually confessed and sung in churches like ours. And it's this incredible outline of the God we worship. So Philippians 2.6, it reads like this. Jesus, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, those five words are groundbreaking, and I remind you that Paul is saying this as a pharisaical Jew less than 30 years after the resurrection. Paul says that Jesus existed before the manger. Have you thought about that? This is Jesus in his pre-existence, and it's a declaration that he's the form, the nature of God, which means Jesus is God. You can't have the nature of God and not be God, for there's only one being in the universe and beyond the universe that has the DNA of God that's God himself. This is not saying Jesus evolved into something. This is not saying Jesus de-evolved into something. This is actually saying that Jesus, who walked around for 33 years in the flesh, is God. And then in the same breath that he says that that Jesus is equal with the Father, then he says he does not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, this is critical to this whole underpinning of what we're talking about tonight. To understand Jesus and the Holy Spirit and his invitation for renewal and spiritual gifts and deliverances, this becomes the critical starting point. This is a theological reorientation to help all of you step forward. This is saying that Jesus is and always will be fully God, chose not to grasp, be selfish, or hold on to the privilege of who he was. Jesus never stopped being God. Jesus never emptied himself of anything. He just chose not to use the thing he had. This is why Eugene Peterson in the message got it right when he said Jesus had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself. He had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. So what did Jesus do? The song answers, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, made in human likeness, being formed in appearance as a man, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So God takes on flesh, incarnation, Christmas time, then he lives a perfect life, amazing ministry, teaching, loving, healing, deliverance, walks with the Father without conflict. Dies a death we deserved, overcomes the grave. And of course, Paul's point in Philippians 2 is humility, 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 even though he's equal with the Father. And then this amazing verse, therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We all said together? Amen. Okay, so you've got Jesus in his preexistence, incarnation, death on the cross, ascension to heaven, forever exaltation. Ah, but, here it is. To understand the Holy Spirit's role in Jesus' life, 
and in your life and in this church's life and how the gifts tie in, you have to ask a different question. How did Jesus not use his godness but remain God between Christmas and Easter? How did he not cling to the advantages of who he was? And here, I'll put it theologically, how does his immutability, because God's nature never change, stay, and yet he chooses not to access that? Let me say this again as I get going. Jesus never emptied himself of anything. He just chose not to access the power he had. And you'll never understand it until you walk from upstairs, Philippians 2, downstairs to Jesus' baptism. Watch this. Luke 3, 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open. The spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. A voice came from heaven. You are my son uh, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. Now, the Holy Spirit is given to Jesus for two reasons. The first is verse 11. You are my son whom I love with you. I'm very, uh, I am well pleased. The spirit of God affirms the identity of Jesus. And we see God in his fullest, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. But here's the second part. The Holy Spirit was also given to lead Jesus and empower Jesus to do God the Father's will. Think about it. Up to this point, Jesus has never healed, never cast out demons, never given new teaching. Only once at 12 years old did he run away from his parents, like all 12-year-olds do, and he's found in the temple, and what? They're like, oh my goodness, he knows the Bible lots. And that's it. Yet right after the Holy Spirit rests on Jesus, all of ministry, all of Jesus' ministry started. He walks with the Father. So here's the, let me work this out. Promise, this is critical. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, empowers Jesus, who's sent by the Father. And here's the uh uh-oh moment. Without the power of the Spirit, Jesus would not have been able to bring the good news or do ministry. Why? Why? Because Jesus never did ministry between Christmas and Easter out of his divinity. Oh, it's real silent. Let me, let me say this again. Jesus only walked in the power of the Spirit. So watch this. Now Luke 4, 1 makes sense. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. In the Mark account, it's more offensive. It actually says in the original Greek that the Holy Spirit pushed Jesus into the wilderness. I'm like, why is the third person in the Trinity pushing the second? I'm totally confused. In verse 14 in Luke, it says he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So doesn't this help you now? How did Jesus, who knows everything, not know when he was returning? How did Jesus, who's God, grow in stature and knowledge and grow from a baby to a 30-year-old? Because Jesus, though he is forever divine and fully human from that point onward, chose not to use his divinity. See, Jesus isn't just your Savior and your Lord. He chose in his incarnation to model what a normal Christian life looks like. So then the question we're all asking is, well, how did Jesus do all the epic stuff like the Sermon on the Mount and casting out demons? Oh, right, he had spiritual gifts, everybody. What? Oh, it's great when charismatics say he was led by the Spirit. What does that mean to me? Oh, this is it. Jesus had the gift of teaching. Jesus had the gift of miracles. Jesus had the gift of healing. And here's the amazing thing. Oh, right, we're the body of Christ and we have the same Spirit and we've been given the same Spirit that Jesus had and we have the same gifts that Jesus used. So, oh, I can imitate Jesus though he's God because he modeled that and because I have the same Spirit he did, now I can walk like he did. If it's not like this, you're screwed. No, I'm not trying to be rude. There's no other way to actually imitate the divine Jesus, the God in flesh, unless he decided not to access his divinity and he was only empowered by the spirit that you have in your everyday life. And that's exactly what the scriptures teach. Now, here's the other side of the coin that's gonna help all of this get to deliverance. Do you notice Jesus leaves always at the wrong time? Oh, it's the wrong time. Thousands of people, this is amazing. This is revival. This is awesome. We've been waiting for thousands of years. And Jesus is like, I'm out. You're like, but you can't leave. There's like 10,000 people. Yeah, I gotta go. Why? I just gotta go. Like, where are you going? I'm leaving. I'm gone. They're like, where is he? Now, why is Jesus always going? Now, some people say he was tired. I think he was tired. Is that the only reason? No. (laughs) Depressed? Actually not. So what was going on with him? Oh, here's what was going on. See, Jesus was choosing not to access right? His godness. So Jesus had to use spiritual disciplines to actually see what the Father wanted him to do. Hold on, Father, where do you want me to go? 
Oh, Jericho. Why Jericho? There's a man. Oh, he's a wee little man? And he's in what type of tree? He's in a sycamore tree. Anyone else? No, just him. You're sure? Okay, good. No, you think about this. See, this is the brilliance of this. See, spiritual practices are the guaranteed place of encounter when walking with God after conversion. They set up the environment to hear what you're called to do. That's why Dallas Willard was bang on when he said, my central claim is we become like Christ by doing one overall thing. Actually, we, we walk like Jesus did. What activities did Jesus practice? Solitude, silence, prayer, simple, sacrificial living, intensive study, meditation on God's word and God's ways and service to others. In other words, spiritual disciplines are how we walk like Jesus because he decided to model for us how to listen and actually spiritual gifts is how we serve like Jesus. Why? Because they're, listen please everyone, they're the only guaranteed place of heaven given power to serve because they're from the spirit. In other words, if you continually try, here's the greatest sin in the North American church. We keep confusing natural gifts, acquired gifts, and spiritual gifts. Listen, some of you are born athletic. I, you can tell, not gifted. Okay, right? It's just natural, but you don't need the Holy Spirit to play basketball. Some of you are brilliant at math and astrophysics. You don't need the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe some of us do. Some of you do not. But there is a difference when the Holy Spirit gifts someone, and that endowment brings the kingdom of God on earth. Most people in church serve out of their natural gifts or their acquired gifts and don't even know what their spiritual gifts are. I love hanging out with kids. I'm so glad you do. Not a spiritual gift. I like playing guitar. Praise God. Not a spiritual gift. All of it important for the church. All can be used. But where are you sovereignly endowed? Because that's how you imitate Jesus as the body of Christ. So this is a critical step. Jesus isn't just savior and Lord, he's model. And this is why it's so beautiful. That's why Paul comes along later and says, we're the body of Christ and we have the spiritual gifts because we're literally following like Jesus did. So let me do this again. At conversion, you're baptized in the spirit. It's not a second thing, it's a first thing. You get baptized in the spirit at conversion. Then you're filled with the spirit. Then we're supposed to pray for this thing called the fruit of the spirit. And then we've got the gifts of the spirit. So this is what happens. When you learn your spiritual gifts, and then a church knows their spiritual gifts, and it's being supported by the fruit of the Spirit, then the impossible becomes possible because now we get to imitate Jesus and do more than he did. How is that? Oh, right, there's not one of him anymore. There's millions of us. This is the missing component in so many churches where we actually can't be disciples because we don't believe we can imitate. Then we've got another major thing over here because we don't have a common lexicon of even what the gifts are. And then most of us, even if we know them, don't function them and have no mentors to use them. And we wonder why we're so ineffective because we keep keep bringing ourselves to the table and not Jesus. The power source is not us, it's him. So this is this critical thing. Why did I just do that little rant? Here's why, because we discovered all this when we started deliverance ministry. We had no context for this in our church. And we started realizing that when we're in certain cases, certain people did certain things and it worked better than the other person. We were like, are they more spiritual? Did they fast more? Did they, was Hillsong turned up more? Like what, what? again, what, what do they have? And then we realized, oh my goodness, <clears throat> it's not about personality. And it's not about how loud you are, or intellectual you are. It's a gifting thing. When that happened, we suddenly went, we better find out what happened. So ready? I'm gonna do this now. Ready? Here's the, here's the overarching thing. When you switch allegiances, you're in. Then, common authority, you get to stand. And then you get to walk in the gifts of the Spirit, and people get set free. And spiritual gifts need to be the center point for a hub of a long-term ministry because you want people that are spiritually gifted in ways that help people who need to be set free. And that's how you actually build momentum and sustainability and not burnout. Because just here's a side note, right? When you find out what your spiritual gift or gifts are, you won't burn out as quickly because actually the well you're accessing isn't you anymore. Really profound. Okay, can I start going through some gifts? Okay, so um, l- let me just, I'm gonna do three or four only tonight that we use in our own context and this hopefully is illuminating for you. Uh, there's 21 gifts, there's a whole conversation to have but just again in the context of deliverance ministry. W- one of the gifts that's so critical in a ministry like this is discernment of spirits. Paul talks about it. By the way, if you want to write down all four gift lists in the New Testament, it's real simple. Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Let me do it again. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. 12, 12, 4, 4. 
Um, now, um, discernment of spirits gets really confused in a lot of churches. So let, let me just help with this. This matters. Um, when people start discovering gifts, and we classify the gifts like this, maybe this is helpful. We call them love gifts, word gifts, and power gifts. We, we, this comes from a guy named Bobby Clinton at Fuller. Very helpful. So love gifts uh, demonstrate the love of God in a room. Uh, word gifts clarify who God is and who he's not and what he likes. So let me do this again. Love gifts, God's love is felt or demonstrated in a room. Word gifts demonstrates or teaches who God is, who he's not, what he likes, what he doesn't. And power gifts evidence his presence in the room in the moment. Uh, by the way, um, you ever sat on a three-legged stool before? Yes or no? Yes, yes thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if I remove one of the legs, what happens? I isn't it wild that most churches only like one or two of the three? So everyone loves love gifts, right, at a church, but they have no clue who they're loving, if there's truth, and we're not even sure if God exists. Then there's other churches that are love truth and all about truth, and trust me, you know the Westminster Confession and the ESV Bible's even bigger and the preaching's really authoritative, but no one's loving and you're still not sure if God exists. And then you're in another church where there's fire tunnels and angels and clouds and all this stuff, but you're not sure where it's all coming from and you're still not sure if you love anyone. See, here's the point. You've got to have love, word, and power to balance each other out because in that environment, then actually the stool actually is balanced and actually God does his thing. And oh, hey, Portland, because I live in a post-Christian environment, this is also the best goal you've got for evangelism and apologetics. People need to be loved in the kingdom, thought in the kingdom, and set free into the kingdom. If you're not empowering all three, you're gonna close a door on a bunch of people. So love gifts, word gifts, and power gifts. Power gifts are the majority of gifts we use in deliverance ministry. So discernment of spirits is about source. Just write that down, source. It's not about information, it's source. So um, this is the best way to do this. Uh, there are three variations of discernment in the church. And if you just wanna write this down, go up to the side and down. This is just the easiest way to do it. Uh, up to the side and down. So uh, certain people that have the spiritual gift of discernment, remember, it's all about source. It's looking behind the curtain. So maybe an image that will help you is, you know, a, like a plug in a wall, like an outlet? The question for a discernment person is, where is the electricity coming from? Not, is it weird? No, I gotta say this again. See, most of us say if it's weird, it's what? It's wrong. Have you read your Bible? How weird is the Bible? How legitimately, bizarrely weird is the Bible? Really weird. We would remove many prophets from our churches. Why are you naked and using dung to, well, I don't understand. Um, <laughs> 911. Um, sure, God told you that, right? So, um, so weird is not the standard, and comfortability is not the standard. Source is the standard. So, a person with discernment, God, and this is critical, God will tell them where it comes from. So, let me just unpack this, and it really matters. So, some people upward know when God's in the room. Yes, He's always present, but when He becomes palpably present, some people are always like, and you're going to know this. You're going to smile. You're going to start going, oh, I know that's you right now. Because you're like, didn't everyone experience like Jesus in service too? I mean, it was the same set, but he was so close. Everyone's like, no, it was just the same. You're like, no, he was like right here. And they're like, shut up. And they're like, okay, okay. But you always, you're just like, Jesus is here. And you know it. And you don't understand why anyone else doesn't, like, why are you more excited? He's here. And you're like, yeah, he's here. You're like, ah. right. So discernment. The second one is this. Certain people have the spiritual gift of discernment. You can look right through a person and know their motives are false. It's all about flesh. The Spirit of God reveals when there's falseness. So let's say I preach an incredible sermon and it's really amazing and everyone laughed and everyone cried and three people got saved and two people came to the altar and we baptized five people, but I was angry the whole sermon. And no one knew it. The Holy Spirit would probably say to someone, hey, you wanna go talk to John and to ask him why he's so angry? See, people with discernment sometimes will know when the Lord is present and that's all they'll know. Other people will know when there's fraudulence in the room even though everything looks and sounds right. And some of you think you're just intuitive. You're not. It's the Holy Spirit. Others of you know when the devil's in the room. And you might experience it like this. Some people just say they go frigid cold, like literally in a freezer, even though it's hot outside. You're like, I don't understand this. Other people talk about seeing them or hearing them or seeing where they are in someone's body. And they just sense the demonic and they can sense when they come and go. And there's all sorts of variations. Here's the point. Discernment of spirits is not just demons. It's discernment of what is the source. Some people only go up. Some people only go down. Some people go to the side and some have two or three. I go up and down. I'm terrible at the side. 
I trust everyone. Everyone's great. Everyone's great. And they're not. Now, I, I'm laughing right now. My friend Natalie is watching online. Uh, she's our prayer pastor at our church. And she has one of the strongest gifts of discernment this way. And do you know what I love about that? She oversees our whole prayer ministry in our church. She's not sure if the devil's in the room or God's in the room, but she can tell when a fraud walks in the room just like that. Why do I want her in that position? Because she is actually gathering all our volunteers to help people be set free. And we can't have all these holes in our ministry of people with character issues. So up, down, and to the side. Does that make sense to everyone? So some of you are going, oh my goodness, it's been my experience my whole life. Yeah. Here's the next thing just to help you out with discernment. Uh, discernment, people get judgy way too quick and get angry because you keep forgetting that the Holy Spirit's telling you something so you think you're discerning it and then you get angry for the people being the thing. So if you have discernment, I just wanna say to you, drop, drop, and roll, first rule, ask Jesus why he showed you what he did. You're not a witch. You don't own this power. You didn't see that. The Holy Spirit showed you that for the sake of the body of Christ. So if you see something, now your new rule is, hey, Jesus, thanks, I don't even own that. Why did you show me that? Do I need to go tell a pastor? Do you want me to pray? What am I supposed to do with the thing you just showed me? Versus, oh, that person again. The other thing that's interesting is if you're more charismatically bent and you see demons, would you stop casting everything out, please? Stop it. Isn't it interesting that Jesus only did what is what? Father told him to do. Why do you think because the Lord shows you a demon, you're supposed to cast it out? You need to stop, drop, and roll and ask permission, do you even want me to confront that thing? The amount of needless casualties that have happened in this type of ministry where someone who's very sincere and loves Jesus goes in the middle of Portland and starts casting out every territorial spirit of this and that, and then their Christian life falls apart. Oh, here's why. You never asked permission. You walked into a fight and thought that common authority was the deal. It's not. It's gift authority under permission of the Father. So hold on, are you saying to me, John, there are people you know that are demonized and you won't help them? 100%. Jesus didn't heal everyone. It's about permission. I wanna walk into a room and know I've got God's backing in this moment to do that thing. Can I keep going or am I done? Okay, good. Just asking for the pastor's covering. Okay, so uh, here, here's the next one. Uh, uh, we all are called into the discipline of prayer, but some of us are gifted in intercession. Now, I made a mistake in the early days in our church thinking if I got all the intercessors together, it would go great. It was the worst thing I'd ever done. They all turned on each other like cats. It was terrible. <laughs> then I realized that the gift came in different forms, and then we helped each other out. So, um, first of all, people with a gift of intercession are continually drawn to prayer. And it can happen in multiple forms. So the first one is like a list person. They love a list. So I know we now live in 2021, but in the ancient times of the 90s when we had bulletins, if you ever remember those days, sometimes in more small churches, what would they actually have in the back? They'd have a list of people. So my mother has the gift of intercession and she loves a list. Like give her 5,000 names and she's just like, oh, it's just so beautiful and I'm praying for her. And I'm like, I wanna kill myself. She's like, oh, it's so amazing. And she just spends hours praying over this list. And I'm just like, this is the most boring thing on earth. And she says, Jesus is so close. And I'm like, is he? I don't even, is he in the room? Um, so, so list prayer people uh, are intercessors. And then there's the prompting people. And some of you are, I, I can just tell even tonight, some of you are those people and you're like, you know, you're doing stuff, you're watching, you're like, you're like, you okay? I gotta pray for North Korea. Bada, bada, kia, bada, Honda, bada, kia. Shit about a Honda, bada, kia. You're like, what's going on? I just thought we were cleaning dishes. And you're like, oh, Lord, save North Korea. And we just cast out. And, blah, 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 blah. and you're like, wow, I just, I'm in. Oh, it's out. It's done. What's done? I, great. Um, so people who are prompters, they're just like, they walk through life and they're like, I gotta pray for that pastor. I gotta pray for this. I gotta pray for this. And, it's, and, and I hate the birthing analogy. I find it very uncomfortable. It's like, they've gotta keep praying till it's done. And then it's done and they're done. And then the third person that I continually find are people that are assigned. There are people that are assigned to pray for certain ethnic groups, certain cities, certain churches, certain pastors, and it's just, they are drawn and called. So I have this incredible woman in my life named Crystal Flogel. She is a 85, 86 year old German woman. She actually lived just outside of Berlin as a five year old when it fell, if you can imagine. And, um, and so she came to Canada and, uh, and so she was part of our church and I took over the youth group and she hated everything I did with the youth group and she dragged me in front of the senior pastor and told me all the things I was doing wrong. It was a great meeting. And, um, and as we left, she was not 83 then and she was much younger then, or 86 then. Uh, as we left, the Holy Spirit said, I just wanna tell you, Crystal, just so you know, that young man you just berated, until you die, 
you're assigned to pray for his ministry. And so she came back and we got to know each other again. Hooray. And, um, and, uh, and here's what's amazing. I've been in ministry in our church for 23 years. I'm 46. And she has prayed with me almost every week for 23 years. And, when, and, she, and the language I would use is almost handmaiden of the Lord. I have no other word for it. And she doesn't know all my deep, dark secrets, and she's not my confessional partner, and, and every time she starts talking about the church and what she doesn't like, I'm like, that's not what this is about. Sorry, no, 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 no. Um, uh, but I'm telling you, like, till her dying breath, she will say, I've been sovereignly assigned to pray for him. She prays for my kids, prays for my ministry, prays for my sexual purity, prays that I don't fall, prays about pride. And when I did deliverances for years, uh, she used to sit beside me and I would be like praying and I'm like, oh, Crystal, I'm really being tempted to lust. She's like, I know, I'm already praying about it. I'm like, great. And it was like everything. I'm feeling really arrogant. Yeah, I know you're arrogant. I'm already praying about it. Look at it. You know, it's great. Very German, very German, uh, very German, uh, very humbling. Uh, but again, can you see how those three types of intercessors would turn on each other? The prompting person's like, where's the spirit? Where's the spirit? The list person's like, I don't know the host, I just want to read the list. I'm assigned to John, you know. Uh, so so um, the critical thing is if you're a prayer person uh, and all three of those types of prayer are critical in deliverance, uh, you've got to understand how you can turn on someone by mistake. Working out how the gifts function and how you allot that in a team really, really matters. Is that helpful? You starting to understand uh, why, why this can really matter. Let me talk about words of knowledge. Just give me the signal, please. Still? Uh, that, like, tell me to stop. Okay. Mm, seven. I sense the seven. No, no. Uh, no, no. Okay, thank you. So words of knowledge is different than discernment. And if, if you have this, you've probably called it discernment and you shouldn't call it discernment. In the early days, we called everything weird discernment because we didn't know the difference. And so uh, words of knowledge are really quite profound. It's when God gives you information you have no access to that humbles or heals someone but never humiliates them. Let me say this again. So a word of knowledge is when the Spirit of God gives you information about a person you do not have access to, and it either humbles them or heals them, but never humiliates them. We discovered this. I, I used to uh, help run these large youth retreats. Uh, we'd have like a 1,000 kids, and I didn't understand why we never had people praying during these retreats. I just didn't understand. Like, we, we have all the smoke and lights, and we have the worship teams and capture the flag and everything else that's probably illegal now, and we do, you know, all that stuff, but I was like, we should have prayer. So in the early days, again, I'm not trying to be facetious. I literally found every weird person that scared me in my church that prayed weird, and I said, you just need to come on the retreat because we have to pray for people. And, um, and so, you know, we used to meet in this large hotel at Niagara Falls, actually, and so what we used to do is we'd go two days early and we would pray over, this is when I found out I hated lists, uh, we'd pray over 1,500 names, uh, and then we'd pray over every single room, every hotel room, uh, in a two-day period. But what started happening that we'd never experienced before in our very conservative context was, and it was very striking, is that we'd be praying through the list and Lindsay would come up, uh, a woman named Lindsay or a girl named Lindsay from Sudbury, I didn't know her, and three of us would hear suicide. And we were like, I, I, where did that? So we didn't understand, so we just put Lindsay's name on a sticky and then on the back we wrote suicide and we started this wall, we called it the sticky wall. And we'd walk up and go, I don't know if Lindsay's coming, but we put it on there. And then halfway through the retreat, a girl would come in and she's like, oh, I'm Lindsay. We're like, oh, you're Lindsay. Are you from like Sudbury? Yeah. Oh, hold on a second. We'd walk over and go, I, uh, this really freaks us out. But like any chance that you've been suicidal? We're like, what is that? See, that's a word of knowledge. One of the most profound things, I shared this in Convergence, the first book I wrote on, on gifts. Uh, we had, a, spirit, we had a, a period of renewal in our church that was documented hundreds and hundreds of cases. It was just shocking and sovereign. And what would happen, uh, myself and the other co-lead pastor, much of the time without talking, would be told to say, pray over the same person without even speaking. And this happened across all of our staff. And one young woman who came from a Filipino context, her husband had uh, cheated on her and abused her. And in a Filipino context, she was still blamed. Even in a Christian context, it was very messy. She ended up in our church. I didn't know the story then. So we actually felt compelled to pray over her. So we walked over. And just to show you how this is demonstrated, I got to eye level and I said, first of all, listen, um, could I pray for you? Not I'm going to pray for you. Could I pray for you? Because I'm in a position of what? Power. Uh, and I'm a white male, right? So, 
So then second question I asked her is, um, okay, um, I, I just, um, while I pray, I said to her, I can be wrong. So if I'm wrong, I'm really sorry. Could you tell me if I tell you some stuff and it's wrong, could you tell me that? I'm open to that because, because we make mistakes. Yeah, no problem. So we both prayed and said, do you mind if I put my hand on you? Asked permission again, yes. So we took this time, we prayed together. It was very powerful. Immediately in my mind, I saw her in her bedroom, sitting in her bed with her Bible open. And I remember her like intensely in this devotional moment. And I very sheepishly said to her, um, I'm really sorry, forgive me. Do you, do, you, do you do your devotions in your bed? And she's like, yes. Like, are you stalking? Like, yes. And I was like, okay. And, she, and I said, I, I know this is weird. Do you, do you read your Bible? Yes. I said, do you sing to him in your bed? She's like, I do. I said, oh. I said, I don't understand what this means to you, but I'm literally watching you sit in your bed with your Bible open. Jesus is at the right hand of your bed and he's looking at you and I'm supposed to tell you he's there and hears you. At that moment, she started weeping, not here. She gutturally cried. And I didn't know what was going on. I just sat there and she cried for like 10 minutes and she kept wailing. I thought he'd left me. I thought he didn't hear me. I thought he'd left me. I thought he didn't hear me. He actually hears me. That's how a word of knowledge is supposed to work. Because it brings absolute life. Why is words of knowledge important? Deliverance. Because in a word of knowledge, much of the time the Lord will reveal how the demonic gain entrance into the person. So words of knowledge are about door opening, information, and discernment is about source. So if you read Acts, if you can bring it up, it's the last scripture, Acts 5.3, you see this in Peter's ministry when Ananias and Sapphira, oh, by the way, side note, who are Christians? They weren't non-Christians, they were Christians and demonized. Uh, verse three, Ananias, how is it Satan has so filled your heart? You've lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. <clears throat> That's both gifts playing at once. Peter says you've lied to the Holy Spirit because you've lied about how much money you got, word of knowledge, and Satan has filled your heart, discernment. See the difference? So discernment as an example, right? Words of knowledge are critical. Intercession is, is critical. Faith in a room is critical, by the way. And let me just help you know what faith is because it's so abused in the church. People who have the gift of faith sometimes are actually um, written off as flighty and it needs to stop. So um, if you really do a diagnostic work with someone who has the gift of faith, it's like they have discernment where God's gonna do the thing. And most faith people have never thought about this. So people who have faith are always like, why don't you believe God's going to do it? He's going to do it. He's going to do it. And you're like, well, yeah, but you haven't seen the Gantt chart and you haven't seen our giving. And have you seen the Portland demographic lately? And you're like, no, God's going to do it. He said it. And you're like, yeah, we're so glad that you're so excited. Um, so ready? People with faith bring oxygen into the room. And people with faith don't say that about everything, but they like almost supernaturally know that out of the five things, God's going to do that thing. So I don't have the gift of faith. And I lead a large church and um, the commission we have as a local church, and, and, and please hear this right, I, I hated this at the beginning. Uh, our vision statement is to become a regional church of 10,000, meaning the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of people in Jesus' name. The 10,000 was not as us Canadians looking at mega churches in the States go, let's be big, it's better. It came out of a prayer meeting. We were terrified by it. There's a whole story behind that. But I'm now leading a church towards 10,000 people in a post-Christian, and hear this right, an anti-American context where actually anything big is viewed with suspicion in Canada. And we're doing this, and I'm like, this is so wrong, and God spoke it, but I don't believe. And my wife has the gift of faith, and it's so awesome. She's like, did God say it or not? I'm like, yeah, he did. Good, wash the dishes and believe. Let's move on. <laughs> and I'm like, but Joe, you don't understand. It's so hard. She's like, did God say it? He did. Well, he's gonna do it then. I'm like, I know. Say it again. All right, so faith is critical in the room. Discernment's critical in the room. Words of knowledge is critical in the room. Intercession is critical in the room. And the last one that's really critical in the room, and I'll end with this, is administration. Um, you know, uh, running a deliverance ministry is like running a worship ministry. Uh, you have all these artistic people that feel and see all this stuff, but someone has to get them into the room. And by the way, if you're in the worship ministry, I love you all. I'm half joking. Uh, but you gotta understand this. Um, the pastoral care component in deliverance means someone doesn't care if you saw Gabriel 
or someone doesn't, like, it's irrelevant. Your question is, is the client getting there? Can you help that, that person getting there? Are they being followed up with? Are they being cared for? Are your team members showing up? Are you doing debriefs? Are you making sure the environment's healthy? Are people acting a little weird? Are you sharing a little too much to the person? And it's scaring them? Like, that type of stuff, most people would never consider in the middle of like a deliverance ministry, but those things are unbelievably important. The, the pipeline that you need to build out in a church long term, we've had four pipelines now in 20 years. We've had to break our ministry. We used to have a year and a half waiting list because so many people were coming to get help and no one else, very few other people in the city wanted to deal with it. And we actually had a shepherd, everyone listening, we had a shepherd running the ministry who cared so much about people. She sacrificed, ready, the movement for the person. And I had to fire one of my friends and reorient her into spiritual direction so I could put in a leader administrator to mobilize 100 people so we could help hundreds of people. This woman, Beth, who's still a great friend of mine and the spiritual director for our staff, she actually became the blockage because of her gifts. Because remember, shepherds love sheep more than movements. <laughs> and it matters where you place people. It's not about sincerity, it's about where you're assigned. And so you can imagine, if you're gonna care for people, you have to think strategically, you have to think theologically, you have to think pragmatically, and you gotta make sure that you never become the bottle. Here's where I end. I became the bottle in the very first run. I have gifts of miracles, I have words of discernment, I have, sorry, I have words of knowledge, I have discernment, and I have miracles. So in my case, I'd walk into a room, I'd sit down and go, okay, when you were 15, you did this. You were 19, you did this. When you are 43, you did this. That's where the three doors opened. You have five demons, A, B, C, D. Come forward right now. Leave, 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 leave. Now, by the way, I'm not being arrogant. This is just how it happened in a two or three hour period. Immediately, I didn't even understand that I had three gifts. And people said, well, it's John, he's intense, he's an Enneagram 8, it's all the things, you know, and I was like, no, it has nothing to do, and then I realized, oh my goodness, in God's sovereignty, he's actually equipped me, even though I'm a senior pastor and a teaching pastor on this other side with these three gifts, and they thought I was the model and they couldn't replicate me. So everyone said, I can't do this because I don't have his personality, I'm not loud, I don't know the Bible like that, and he just does this stuff off the cuff and I need a list. And then we went, oh my goodness, wonder if actually we do really hard work to find out whose gifts are where, and then we form teams like that. So it doesn't matter if there's one, two, or five people, that same environment's being built and people can be set free. So it's critical as you begin this conversation. The reason why I spent so much time on spiritual gifts tonight is because this ministry will never get off the ground until you think you can imitate Jesus. You have a common lexicon on gifts. You know what you mean when you mean those gifts. You start character evaluations on people's gifts and then you get right gifts in the room to set people free. And we're done. All right, three quick questions to wrap up. How might someone know if they were demonized? Great question. Um, yeah, so one of the things I want to encourage everyone is not to be afraid. This is what I was saying to you beforehand. Every time I do a talk like this or it's an extended talk, there's someone in the audience who loves Jesus deeply who goes, oh no, oh no, oh no, that's me. So here's the first thing you need to do. Number one, you need to say to Jesus, is that me? And don't be afraid. There's a sovereign reason why you're here tonight, and Jesus is a good shepherd. And so if you're demonized, fine, you're demonized. You're like, John, no, really, it's gonna be okay. There's a reason why you're at this church this night. All this is gonna work out. You might know you're demonized, and here's one way I would say it. Um, people think that when they're delivered, everything gets better, and it sort of does, but we have a phrase we use all the time in our own context. When demons leave, you're still stuck with you. <laughs> yeah, they get a bumper sticker. A great t-shirt. When demons leave, you're still stuck with you. Um, so one of, the, one of the best ways to um, think about this is think about a fire and you have a natural struggle with pornography, you have a natural struggle with lying, you have a natural struggle with hatred or racism, whatever the inclination you have sinfully. It's like when the demonic, if they are present inside of you, add um, gas to the fire, 
and intensify it in such a degree, it's almost like you can't stop. And once that's removed, the fire stays, but it's much less intense. Uh, a lot of times you'll talk, uh, if we're going to be very honest here, lots of you have had the experience where um, you are perpetually feeling tracked or haunted, to use non-Christian language. Um, you come from families where there's always been supernaturalism that's been passed down. One of the things I need to say tonight that's really critical is that any gift that you had pre, pre-salvation is not from our side. So, you know, lots of people say that they had all these experiences before they were Christians and then they become Christians and, oh, that's discernment. Oh, it's not actually. It's not from our side. So you actually have to do a spiritual gift, uh, spiritual experience inventory. Before I was saved, uh, did, I, did I do all this stuff? Well, then you need to go to the, the true Jesus. And by the way, this matters, not being sort of charismatically legalist, but make sure what Jesus you're talking to because there are many demons called Jesus. Uh, I remember I cast out a demon. I said, you need to go to Jesus. And I literally watched it go another, to another demon called Jesus. I'm like, no, no, Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of God the Father. Oh, and that changed. Um, and so you need to say, Jesus, I, any experience I had pre-conversion, uh, I give that over to you. Some of you uh, have real trouble around pastors and elders or people of authority, and that's not because of trauma or abuse. You don't understand why you have a natural hatred. That's a good signal. Um, sorry. Um, uh, uh, another thing is you might struggle with reading. Here's a great example from my dad. Uh, my, my dad was a missionary. My dad was on OM in, in the 70s, like gave his life for Christ. Um, and until he was 60, he had incredibly difficult, a difficult time reading the Bible. And uh, he has dyslexia. I have dyslexia. My grandmother, so that's part of it. But it was an unnatural blockage. He went through deliverance, and now he can read his Bible fine. So anything that is holy, communion gets perverted, you struggle with coming in church buildings. I'm, I'm just trying to give a thousand things. So, uh, you, have a, you have an internal voice that continually says you're not saved, you're garbage, you're nothing. You know, clinicians have names for all of this, but it is interesting that when you take some time back, um, sometimes the voice uh, that has been with you for a long time, you actually think it's you and you should ask Jesus if it is. If, if one were to think, I think that there's a chance I'm demonized, yeah. can you pray for your own freedom yeah. or do you need others? Yeah, so, okay, this is, I'm so glad you brought this up. I didn't think we were going to cover this tonight. Uh, what's the very first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned? They hid. Uh, self-deliverance is hiding. See, th- this is... I want self-deliverance. Sorry, I thought that was the whole answer. I was like, no. all right. Thank yeah. you. No, self-deliverance is... High. What I mean, of course you can stand in common authority. Mm-hmm. Yes, James 4, 7. Yes, Ephesians 2. Yes, Ephesians 6. Stand your ground. But again, for, I mean Catholic, the universe. This is a Catholic thing. You need shepherds to come and remove wolves from your life. Hiddenness says, I get to hang out with Jesus by myself and I don't get to experience confession and grace. You know one of the most powerful things that I love about our church? There's lots of things I struggle with in our church. One of the things I love is that we do this ministry in a church and it's not a separate parachurch thing out there. So I meet with someone, and again, in our system, like when you start this process, we ask you like 250 questions. Like your whole life is exposed. And because um, we're looking, where are the doors, right? And there's a whole process of how we do that well. Here's the point. When I see you the following Sunday and I know everything that happened to you and I even saw demons in you, I'm like, hey, good morning. So glad you're at church today. And the person goes, yeah, it is good to be at church. And they see grace. And you're like, oh, I still get to be here? And yeah, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And then um, finally, and this is actually a question came up a number of times and I've seen this in you. Can you just give an example of a daily or regular prayer for protection? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be intense and verbose and like, you don't need a shofar. You don't need to walk around your house seven times. Uh, you know, like, it, it's, this is literally how it goes. So I start my day, I wake up. Uh, very first thing I do is I reaffirm that Jesus is my savior, my leader, my Lord. This is just what I do every morning. I'm not getting reconverted, I'm just declaring. Uh, every day I, I um, uh, recommit my pastoral vows and my, my marriage vows. Every day I say, I'm, I'm saying yes to my pastoral vows and marriage vows. 
So I'm going to stay in that thing. Then I say to the Holy Spirit, uh, what fruit of the Spirit am I going to need today? And he usually tells me, and then I pray into that, and then I put on the armor of God. In the shower. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of right. Like, just put it on. Gearing up for the day. That's it. In the morning. Just right there on your bare body. Just cold, right, cold, cold, cold steel cold, armor cold steel. of God. That's okay. right. mm. The Holy Spirit's there, though. Warm. And then uh, at night, uh, my wife and I uh, will pray, and it's a real simple prayer. We'll just say, uh, this home is Jesus's. And our property is Jesus's. And our children have each been dedicated to Christ. So in the name of Jesus Christ, nothing demonic can be in our house or on our property. You have to leave in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Like, it's just, doesn't have to be verbose. It's just true. 